Hello, and welcome to Cranfield University. In this interview series, we explore the role of philosophy and humanities more broadly for management, engineering, but also for other practical professions. My name is Andrei Pavlov, and I'm Professor of Strategy and Performance at the School of Management. And I'm Toby Thompson, Studio Director, and also interested in executive education, uh, Heidegger, and all aspects of continental philosophy, so-called. And our guest, guest today is Professor Paul Standish, Professor of Philosophy of Education and the Head of Centre for Philosophy of Education at the University College London. Paul, welcome. Welcome to Cranfield. Thank you very much, Andre. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, Toby. Hi. Paul, can I just start with a very broad question? Uh, so to me, philosophy and, and education are almost intertwined. I mean, I, it's very difficult for me to imagine education without philosophy um, and almost philosophy without education as well. So can I just ask you, what, what is philosophy of education for you? Well, the straightforward answer here is to say that philosophy of education uh, looks at central questions in education, in relation to educational policy and practice, which cannot be answered empirically. They need argument, they need reasoning. And uh, such questions would include the aims of education, the nature of knowledge, the nature of understanding, and the idea of the good life. So built into all these questions is an ethical dimension what is the nature of the good life? What is the nature of the good society? And how do we come to that good life and that good society? I think your starting point is uh, superb from my point of view, because I think the status of philosophy of education is really rather unusual. And in some ways, the name mis may be misleading. I think philosophy of education is not a branch of philosophy. So it's not a branch like philosophy of psychology or philosophy of science or of music and so on. Right. And one reason is that if you look across the range of branches of philosophy, then in fact, they all can come into education in some way. Um, for example, philosophy of music would have a bearing on music education and so on. And you can run that with, I think, all branches of philosophy, really. Uh, so it's not a branch of philosophy like that. And uh, I don't think also that it's an applied form of philosophy where you work out theories here and then apply them there. But to take the first of these points to begin with, uh, your starting point that the two seem to be very closely intertwined, philosophy and education, I think goes to the heart of what philosophy of education is and how it should be seen. Because what's distinctive of these kinds of inquiry into the nature of the good life, the nature of human beings, the nature of knowledge and so on, these are actually central and fundamental questions to philosophy itself. Exactly. You don't get very far in reading Plato before you come across dialogues, not just about the good life, but how we come into the good life, not just about the nature of knowledge, but the nature of learning as well. So, and I think uh, to pursue the uh, point a little bit further, that if you do go into philosophy of more specialized forms like aesthetics or, or, or logic and so on, then it's not just um, a question of considering these matters in the abstract. There's also an education in these matters. And there's a question of how knowledge and understanding is advanced in those matters. So they, those, again, are questions of education, whether it's education in the form of lectures and seminars or research itself. So there's a very close connection between the two. Now, John Dewey said that uh, philosophy was education in its most general aspects, mm. by which he meant in its most uh, universal or wide ranging, um, in some ways, abstract, I suppose, aspects as well. And uh, I'd also say that while another parallel might be drawn between philosophy and jurisprudence, philosophy of education and jurisprudence, it might be said that jurisprudence stands in relation to the law, to legal practice and uh, legislation and so on, in the same way that philosophy of education stands in the way stands in relation to educational policy and practice. But I do think education is wider than that because it's not just concerned with what's going on in schools or universities or in vocational forms of education. It's really a question about how we live. It's a question that appertains to life as a whole. Um, and kind of built into that statement is the belief that it's the nature of a human being never to fully arrive at some destination, but always to be on the way. 
so that our lives, like it or not, are a process of continuing education, which we may or may not conduct well. Mm. It's it's a really interesting point that you're making that um, philosophy of education is essentially not not a form of practical philosophy, or at least not fully a form of practical philosophy. Of course, because education takes place outside of um, formal educational settings, or what we choose to call formal educational settings. Um, and and so, yes, the questions have to be broader. In fact, you know, when you were speaking, um, it rem you reminded me of a famous quote, I think, attributed to Mark Twain, who said that I never let my studies interfere with my education. Uh, That's right. I like that. And <laughs> yeah, I use it. I use it quite often uh, when uh, when in 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 my lectures, and even though in, in, we do it in the formal setting, formal educational settings, when we when we stray away from um, from from I suppose standard questions. Um, but so if it's not a form of practical philosophy, um, who? Uh, who are the people like you who engage in this, in these debates, and who engage in, with these questions? Um, where do they come from? What's their background, and what do you think they pursue? Can I comment first of all on your framing of that question? Because I don't think I want to say it's not a form of practical philosophy. It all depends on what's turning on that phrase, practical philosophy. The the description that people quite often come up with is that it's philosophy applied to educational practice, and that's sure. what I want to resist. One reason is that you know philosophy sometimes has made a bad move in this respect, in that sometimes philosophers of education have seen their role as sorting out the um, principles on which policy should be based, and then delivering those principles to the policymakers and the practitioners, and then letting them do the more technical work. My my, uh, my conception is almost the that turned upside down, in that I think that if you're a thinking teacher, whether it's in an infant school or a university uh, um, department, then if you look at the practical questions that teaching and learning and the study of your subject, um, the, the, those, the, the questions that are raised by teaching and learning and the study of your subject, and if you push those questions, you find yourself coming to questions about the nature of knowledge, the nature of the good life, the good society, mm. and the nature of human being. So there's a, you know, these are very holistic questions. It's a very holistic set of questions. And I don't really think they separate in the way that our institutional structures sometimes mm. make them appear to do. I'm not saying there are no divisions. Of course there are, and I'm fairly clear about what's a philosophical question and what is not. But I, I think that the uh, pervasiveness of what I'm calling philosophy in human life is much broader than people allow. Mm. And so, would you say education is one of the one of the ways of getting to those questions? Uh, it's, it's almost like a lens or a crowbar that allows you to engage with these questions. Well, uh, not all education is philosophy. I don't want to say, say that, but I think there's a philosophical dimension to education in many different respects and at different levels, and that um, teachers, you know, who never use the word about what they're doing often do raise these questions in the course of their teaching of science or history or teaching little children, um, telling a story to little children. All sorts of different circumstances can raise questions of this kind. So it, it goes with what I'm saying that I, I want a fairly porous conception of uh, philosophy as a discipline. Um, I don't think it's a discipline that's defined exclusively by a set of categories, oh. um, subdivisions on a university course. I think it is a kind of questioning that extends through our lives more generally, as I've said. And I think that, um, you know, scientists, for example, who are engaged into research into uh, pollution, let's imagine, you, I believe you were talking about water earlier on, let's think of research into pollution, then obviously very a, a large part of what they're looking into um, will be of a technical kind, a technical scientific kind. But presumably their motive in looking into pollution, the, the very idea of pollution hardly makes sense unless there's some notion of uh, cleanliness, the value of mm. cleanliness, the um, appropriate degree of uh, a lot of the tolerance of uh, chemicals that shouldn't normally be there and so on. All those things are ethical matters and how we should deal with these will come into uh, what the work of the scientist or the technologist is doing. Mm. 
And, and sometimes people on courses related to such matters um, are in effect deflected from these ethical or philosophical matters. There's a, a prevailing tendency in our society to turn everything into a technical question and to suppose there's a scientific solution. This applies also to the way teachers are trained, that Absolutely. Um, nowadays teachers are often uh, seen as technical operatives in the delivery of the curriculum. And that frustrates the inclination they might have and they might discover in the actual practice of the classroom, whereas I've tried to emphasize ethical and epistemological and other philosophical questions arise uh, frequently, I'm inclined to say at every point. Can I take it back a step because we've dived straight into philosophy and I think as we're talking here, people are gonna be Googling <laughs> Paul Standish uh, and if you're listening to this too. Um, Paul, what are your interests? Uh, I know you've written a book, uh, Wittgenstein and Education, on not sparing others the trouble of thinking, which is a fantastic title. I know it's Wittgenstein's phrase. And I know you're interested in Stanley Cavell. Can you say a bit more about those interests? Uh, yes. Would it help if I go back a little bit into how I got interested in all this? Because this, if I tell this story briefly, yes, that's will reinforce yes. what I've been talking about. Uh, so I, I spent a long time teaching in schools and especially uh, further education colleges. Um, some 20 odd years before I uh, started work in a university. And what struck me is precisely what I've described, that I found that when there was a new initiative in the college or the school, um, when I thought through what existing practice was, I frequently came across the question, you know, why are we doing this? Is this the best way to do it? What purpose does this serve? How is this uh, in the interests of the child or society and, and so on? And so I was very much led in that direction. Uh, there was plenty of talk about such matters, um, including when I trained to be a teacher and um, strong arguments from so-called progressive educators in favor of moving away from chalk and talk, um, moving away from the classroom uh, where desks are lined in rows and children are expected to sit silently and moving towards a relationship that's more flexible, more relaxed, a structure of practice in the classroom that's more mobile and dynamic, and a more cooperative and experiential approach to learning. And there's much that's right about that, and certainly some of the practice they were trying to contest was uh, lamentable. You can run a similar argument with universities as well, I think, in some respects, but I'll, I'll, leave, I'll set that aside unless you want me to say more. Um, what struck me about this was that there was a strong child-centered focus in all this. Indeed, that was the name that it typically went by, child-centered education. And it seemed that whatever the child felt or whatever the child was doing, uh, whatever its motives were, there was something sacrosanct about them that you had to start from those motives and allow them to unfold naturally. So the figure of the child as a plant unfolding or possibly as an animal gradually developing in its own natural way through its encounter with experience, its encounter with the environment, that was a very powerful one. And I felt that though there was much going for this, there was also the danger of a kind of egocentricity generated mm. in children when uh, their own responses, their own feelings was taken to be central to all this. And uh, the same sort of thing was happening in a, a more filtered down way in secondary school. In higher education, further education, a kind of pale shadow of these ideas came in onto the scene in the 1980s in further education and in the 90s in the, first of all, the new universities, so-called, and then in the uh, traditional universities, so-called. And so student-centeredness is, is very much the order of the day, student agency, that kind of focus. And the customer orientation has been added to this, which, of course, wasn't there in the child-centered education that I mentioned earlier on. Now, in the course of this, it st struck me that something was going wrong, that there was too much of a centering on the self of the child or the student and an insufficient turning of attention beyond the self towards the content of learning. So way back, it struck me that the content of learning, the thing that was being studied, was of paramount importance, that it should be something worthwhile, worthy of attention, whatever it was. And that ironically, the best development of the self, the best prospects for the young person or older person for that matter, was where that attention was turned beyond themselves. And then in that encounter with the world, in trying to find meaning or, or seeing 
how others found meaning in the world, then that was the best prospects for them actually to develop as people. The current version of the thing I'm criticizing at the higher education level is captured by William Dereshevitz's, I think, 2015 book, yep. Excellent Sheep. Excellent Sheep, Sheep. yeah. Mm. Yes, in which he looks at um, elite universities in the United States, where the students all come through with straight A's, where they don't just have straight A's, they also excel in the debating society and in some sport, probably, and maybe work in the community. And they're building CV, they're building their CV through every stage of this. They're doing this very self-consciously. Mm. They're even taught to do it. This is what higher education is for. You must already have your focus on the job that you're hoping to secure in 10 years' time, and so on. And what Dereshevitz says is roughly that these people are becoming sheep-like. They're not thinking for themselves. They are following the, the trend, following the crowd. And actually, they're being frustrated in some inner part of themselves because somewhere they have this intimation that there's something more to education, something more to be enriched by or to discover and that was what I'm talking about as a process that requires going beyond the self, turning outwards, not as a kind of um, uh, self-denial in some um, uh, uh, ascetic way, but actually as, as a means of focusing attention on what matters, what matters out there to people, what matters to me, how do I see myself in that, where can I find things that are meaningful? And um, my sense of that, in a way you can find things that are meaningful, is that this is very diverse. So I have no formula for the aims of education. And I've, I think some people have a rich education when they go into work quite early and then find the career they take up. It might be a craft-like activity, like mm. being a fisher, a, a, a fisherman, fisherwoman. Um, it might be a craft activity like that, but they become inculcated into this culture and practice which has been refined through the generations and which has developed not just skills in relation to catching fish, but a ho the whole, uh, a whole practice, the feel of a practice and a way of life, a whole ethos is attached to it. Now, I don't want to get sentimental about this. I think it would be quite wrong to glorify craft activities in, um, in the way that's so tempting. And Toby likes Heidegger and you know, Heidegger talks about the cabinet maker's apprentice, the carpenter in this kind of respect. And that's a very rich text, I think. But um, I, I think there's a grave danger of nostalgia or, or sentimentality in relation to this. So I think you've got to look at the, 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 the jobs that are around today, the kinds of practices that people are engaged in. And certainly, I think you can imagine someone might be involved in desktop publishing or possibly in managing studio videos of the kind that we're involved in now. All of these things have a craft element to it. There's something that the practitioner becomes more skilled at more imaginative over, more creative in. And that's a, those are skills, traditions, which are acquired through years of practice in relation to other skilled people and with an open eye to the possibilities that technology affords for the future. So it'd be very much a, a forward-looking and affirmative a relation to skills, uh, skilled action, um, uh, craft practices, engineering and uh, other practices where familiarity with an area of work draws you into it. It becomes an area where you dwell, another Heideggerian favorite word, where you belong, where you, you, look, you want to go back to, you feel connected with, and which of course feeds into the way you perceive the world and act more broadly. So I, I, that was a rather long answer, but I hope it covers some of what you were concerned with. You talk, Paul, there about um, schools, about further education, about higher education. Is it useful to categorize education in those slices? Or are you talking about education generally? Uh, well, ultimately, I'm talking about education generally, but I don't think you can, you, you know, there, there's every reason for having schools and other institutions in which education is organized in focused ways there's reason to have qualifications and so on. I don't want to overturn the whole thing by any means. Um, but the, the trouble with the structures we have now is that it's become too systematic, too rigid in many ways. And of course, um, someone's going to come back at me and say, well, it's not as rigid as it used to be because now we have modularity. Mm -hmm. Now you can change from one topic to another. 
Yes, but the point is that the structures that support this modularity are increasingly bureaucratic. Uh, they're increasingly characterized by assessment methods that are reductive in character because the student comes onto the module, sizes up what they've got to do, how many essays they need to write, how much they can avoid doing, tries to maximize the chances of the highest grade in that single essay they're going to do. And of course, this actually thins out their education. It thins it out partly laterally because they're not covering so much in terms of breadth, but it also alters the very idea of education because it becomes a matter of completing this module, closing the block books or shutting down the websites or whatever it is, and then going on to the next module and the next thing that's going to be added, added to their CV. So those structures are a frustration of education and teachers are forced into cooperating with those structures to a large extent. About the terminology, uh, Toby, I, I, you know, this is, it's very local in some ways. The term further education is rather peculiar to the English speaking world and especially mm. not, not to, North, not to um, the United States, but to uh, the, the Great Britain, I would say in many ways. Um, and higher education used not to refer to university education as in uh, amongst many different, in, in many different countries. So I think there's an arbitrariness to these classifications. I don't particularly mind them being there. We've got to have names for things. And there's some point in having structures that, you know, jo join institutions at the same level in common approaches. Um, but of course, I think one's eye should be on something beyond what is contained or restricted within uh, course descriptors and um, sets of aims and objectives. Those are the limiting things, really. It's not the descriptor. It's the lames, aims and the, it's the lists of objectives and learning outcomes. Mm. Um, another, you know, pernicious term, if we're talking about terms, is the term criteria, because you know criteria have always been there. I think there are criteria that run through human practices, and for the most part, we don't spell these criteria out. There are criteria for sitting on a chair, for example, but no one normally lists the criteria, except perhaps if you're in a studio. Um, <laughs> TV studio. Um, but more seriously, uh, the, the, the way criteria has come to be understood by so many practicing teachers is not in the broad sense I've just described, but as a set of uh, a checklist and quite often understood in binary terms, either the student has satisfied this criterion or not. Um, one university which will remain nameless um, about 20 years ago when, when this kind of objective setting and um, uh, learning outcome focus was being uh, was gathering speed. In their teacher education program, they had 172 learning objectives that the uh, student had to hit. And the word hit, of course, is symptomatic of this kind of mm. um, aggressive, con consumptive approach to education. Mm. I got a ton more questions, but you go next. Yeah, um, uh, I suppose what I'm, <laughs> what I'm going to try and do. Uh, and please forgive me, Paul, as I'm going to try and ask you a very poorly formulated question, which I think have been doing, I've been doing in these interviews, because obviously, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm trying to kind of to, to get to the nub of it. But I think uh, let, let me just try and, and ask it. Um, so if we see education uh, in this kind of general way and in um, we see it essentially as as intimately connected to the questions of living a good life and and uh, and developing and improving the life are we saying then um that the responsibility for education lies within every single person and um and that person should be the center of um essentially thinking about education and designing his or her own educational journey to use the word design and how does that square with the, I suppose, the prevailing view of education as, let's say, a public good that uh, then, of course, is being managed uh, in a very process-oriented way by, by the state? Well, I'm not sure uh, the prevailing conception is quite as you said, because the, I, um, especially over the last 20 years, I think there's been a customerization of education. That's the word that's been used following on customization, customerization of edu education. Oh, yes. And um, it's 
it follows the principle that the student should be uh, treated as a, a free agent. The word student agency, phrase student agency is used by the OECD, for example, very frequently now. It's, the, it's a key term in their, their policy. And the idea then is that the student becomes a responsible chooser. They're not talking about university students, by the way, they're mostly talking about school students. Mm. Um, the student becomes a responsible chooser, perhaps choosing their learning style or working out which one suits them best, or choosing how to approach a particular topic and so on, but uh, the choosing assumption... which modules to do. Sorry. But I was going to say, but the assumption then is still that, uh, yes, the, ch the student can now choose from a greater variety of options, but the options are still uh, provided by the educational yeah. apparatus, the by educational, educational system, which of course suffers from all of the drawbacks that, that you've mentioned. Yes, uh, and, and the system is, um, to, to a significant degree, committed to providing um, a, a workforce, to providing um, people who will be able to produce mm. produce things using that word very broadly. So the student is making us in the, the system is making children students into good producers and good consumers, because we'll need to be good choosers in the all the opportunities that the neoliberal market provides for us. Now this, of course, is quite flattering to the student in some way because they're being told, you know, it's up to you, it's your choice. You take responsibility for this. You take it upon yourself. And, you know, that may sound attractive to them. It sounds more attractive, perhaps, than just being told this is what you've got to do. But actually, I think, personally, it's a, a deflection of their attention onto um, minor matters of the exercise of choice and a kind of introspection about, do I really want this or do I really want that? Uh, is this me or is that me? deflects them into questions like that, as opposed to the turning of attention to things that are worthwhile doing, the point of which they may not fully understand yet, but in a relationship of trust towards the teacher or the, the school, the system, that they're going to be led to something that may be meaningful, may be worthwhile for them. So um, I think the it's a feature, I think, of neoliberalism that, you know, uh, it presents us with so much choice and it flatters us that we are autonomous. Um, our likes and dislikes and so on, feedback on products, um, uh, loyalty cards work on this basis as well. It, it, it flatters us as consumers and promotes uh, and actually educates us to be better consumers, to do, do more of the same, more, mm. cons more consumption. So I think it's the whole thing is locked very much into that mindset now, which I think is more extensive, more um, stifling than was the case uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Do you think I don't this... mean everything is fine. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say this autonomy is problematic because of the issues that it brings, or would you would you say that it's actually actually an illusion in the in the world that is so in the world that is controlled by a lot of structures in there and the, and where the choice can actually be just you know perceived choice but not a real choice and certainly not a free one yes it's i mean it's not totally an illusion because you can choose and you can you know some products are better than others and it's quite wise to check out what's out there in the market or consult the witch report or whatever it might be so uh, this is one of the um kind of tricky natures of the the tricky nature of the world we live in because so much of it is pretty reasonable, it seems, and yet it does absorb us into this kind of subjectivity, this kind of self-conception. And uh, there's a kind of autonomy that attaches to that. We are free choosers in the shopping mall. Um, and if the economy works well, we've got enough money to spend in the shopping mall and so on. But there's also something soporific about it. There's something tranquilizers, tranquilizing. Uh, Foucault says it rend renders us into social, um, sorry, it makes us docile subjects. Mm. And I think that that's, that's a pervasive feature of the culture. It's not just schooling, it's not just universities, it's what the television does to us as well. And there's quite a strong educational, quasi-educational current that runs through education. Think of the attention to mental health, for example, now. And uh, although that's, you know, it's well intended um, for the most part, I'm sure. Nevertheless, there is actually something a little bit disabling about it as well. So going back to your question about autonomy, 
yes, we're given autonomy within a particular range, to be, the autonomy to be a good consumer and so on. But I think it actually undermines autonomy in what might be its more meaningful aspects. Mm. It's not my favourite word because the word, uh, although you know, I, I could hardly argue against autonomy because my argument depends upon being autonomous in some degree. Um, but it's not my favourite word because I think it actually works against this turning of attention beyond the self in the way that I've argued through for throughout my career. I, I got a question. And it's on behalf of the audience watching this who may think that mm. to be a philosopher, Paul, you've got to be a grumpy cuss. Uh, you've got to question pretty much everything. Um, <laughs> you talked about neoliberalism. I know you talk about managerialism. You talk about the sovereign individual and the consumer. Um, the whirlwind that's facing us right now with the erosion of democracy and liberalism and so on, I guess you're going to say education is a solution to all that? Well, of course, it depends what's meant by education. And I don't think the educational practices and systems we have now are a solution to it. I think they are its accomplice. Um, and you know, we're talking about massive things now, aren't we? Not, it's not just Huge. the particular turn that neoliberalism has brought us to. It's also the climate crisis and mm -hmm. uh, increasing populations in the world. Um, you know, the, the prospects are uh, very, very serious. Dire. Um, unprecedented. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of being grumpy. I think it's a matter of being realistic and affirming the possibilities of a different kind of existence, which is what I've tried to do in various ways. And um, uh, in, to be specific about this, I think sometimes that many teachers and actually quite a few students and uh, learners at different levels will have some inkling of the kind of thing I'm talking about, then there are these possibilities in education that can change our lives or open to us to new possibilities. And that inkling is being snuffed out, as it were, it's being suppressed by the dominance of performativity, as you might put it, the excessive emphasis on learning outcomes and measures of competition and, and so on. Some evidence for that inkling of something beyond all this can actually be found in uh, films and literature. And let's go to some quite popular films, films like uh, Freedom Writers. I don't know if you would know the film, but it's uh, set in the wake of the Rodney King riots uh, following the brutal um, arrest of Rodney King by police in Los Angeles in the early 90s. And it's about, based on the true story of Erin Gruel who uh, was a beginning teacher at that time, and she turned around a class of children, teenagers, who were suffering and uh, deprived and affected by the racial tensions and the crime in the area and so on. So she was successful in transforming these people's lives. And this is a film I've used in, in teaching quite a lot. In the end, I don't especially like the film. I think it's a well-made film, but I don't like it because it's very much a Hollywood gloss on the things I've been talking about, and it makes it seem too easy in so many respects, too clear-cut and sentimentalizes it. But the, the reason for mentioning it is that this is a highly successful film, and people are drawn to it because they see in this depiction of education, this suggestion of education being transformative, opening us to new some new possibility. Um, so I'm against the melodrama, but that's a uh, um, just a, a signal of the wider appetite there is for these things mm. and the fact that many practitioners feel stifled in these respects. So is there is there a space for insurrection? I know elsewhere in your work you talked about Thoreau and, and Walden and doing things differently, disobedience. Is, is that something that we can embrace or look towards for some sort of antidote to this um, putting under, under, the, under the needle. Uh, there, there is a space for this, I think, and it's probably true that teachers have always subverted the system in some degree. And, uh, you know, good students often do this in some way or other. Um, the, the idea of the, there, there's an orthodoxy about what constitutes a good student, um, a, a model that you've got to conform to, and that needs to be avoided. And similarly, there's an orthodoxy about what constitutes good teaching. Um, again, governed by the measures of success that I've been talking about. 
So there's room for some subversive, subversiveness, subversion rather, subversiveness, I suppose is the word, um, on the part of teachers and, and, and students. Um, and I don't think this leads to the idea that you should overthrow the system. You know, that kind of revolutionary outlook, I think, is uh, something that we needed to move away from. Because it's not as though everything that's done is disastrous. It's not as though everything is wrong. There's just something um, out of key with what it should be. And I think then that the role of the um, subversion should be to tinker with the minor elements in the system so that these, in effect, start to unravel some of the broader structures and open a way to new kinds of practice. And I'm echoing here words of Jean-Francois Lyotard, who talked about the need for minor stories as opposed to grand narratives. In other words, minor ways of adjusting or altering something, working in the interstices of the system, as he puts it, rather than the revolutionary approach. Um, and indeed, it's what Jacques Derrida talks about when he refers to, when he, when he speaks of deconstruction. Because deconstruction is not a project to overthrow something or to destroy it. On the other hand, it's recognizing what happens, that actually systems do fray at the edges, things do come apart a little bit, they will alter anyway. And it's to work in tune with that process of alteration, further growth and further, further change. And readiness to do unpalatable things too sometimes, readiness to, to be disruptive in some degree of what the expected system is or the norms that prevail are. And so that kind of subversiveness, I th do think, is is desirable. And I know in your work, you you've you've also talked about the therapy of education. And uh, would that be a more or more benign way, I suppose, of addressing some of these issues without the uh, without the insurrection and insurgency, but exactly um, by going through the through the re reassessment, reevaluation, deconstruction of what's going on? Or how do you how do you see this metaphor? Uh, well, Toby is going to accuse me of being grumpy again, but uh, <laughs> that's not. I wouldn't read it quite like that. Uh, for a start, it's questionable whether it's a metaphor. Um, you know, in, in ancient uh, Greece, there was a kind of proximity between um, notions of therapy and notions of education. And that proximity is there also in Wittgenstein in the 20th century. Um, the way I, so two parts to this answer then. One is that I think what's currently going on in the name of therapy because of the mental health problems, because of the prospects of uh, climate, well, the, the actuality of climate crisis. What's currently going on, I think is in the name of mental health education is I think partly misguided because it's kind of tinkering with the system uh, when a broader understanding of our lives and our world is needed. Uh, we're, we're in a world where people are expected to work at quite high pressure, students as well as uh, in working life and uh, constantly chasing targets. There's a kind of excessive busyness that dominates our lives and an acceptance that we must pursue more growth, we must raise our targets, we must raise our achievements all the time without standing back from those measures and uh, having time to, to think more broadly about what is meaningful in life. So the therapy that I think is needed is not going to be achieved by interventions such as happiness classes mm -hmm. or learning to manage your stress. It's going to be achieved, achieved rather by looking at works, and they might be in science, they very often will be in the humanities, looking at works that actually make you think about what things mean, what things have value, whether you can recognize a description of how the world is in what another writer pursues, whether you can find ways to, to word the world, ways of describing the world and your situation that you can stand behind, that you can believe are really your words, as opposed to all those received words we get from teachers mm. or from Google or Wikipedia. Um, those words that sometimes we're compelled to put into our essays because we know the examiners are going to be looking for those words and they can tick off the box that relates to that criterion. Mm -hmm. So this finding of meaning through the way others have found a meaning is exactly what the humanities are concerned with. Take a subject like history, you know, history looking at um, a, a war, say the war in Korea, the civil war in the 50s, um, 
that war is not just a physical event, manifestly. It depends upon all sorts of ideas, principles, uh, beliefs that the competents had about what was going on. It, are, it raises questions on a global scale about the political imperatives behind this. And these motives, these uh, writings of the time, the films that were made and so on, the recordings by those who were there at the time, all of these things involved exercises of judgment, people interpreting what was happening, people showing one point of view and not another. This is exactly the kind of things that history historians labor over in trying to make sense, in trying to find a reading of these events that's more coherent. Now, that is an exercise in what makes meaning and what is meaningful, what Ooh. makes sense. That is central to what we have to do in our lives. Like it or not, we have to do that. The alternative is kind of giving up and, you know, accepting some some simple version of life that's brought to you by some of the media or perhaps by being indoctrinated into particular beliefs in certain cultures. Mm. But um, throughout the world, there are people who don't want to settle for that. And actually, most of us don't want to settle for that. We want to try and find things that are meaningful and not settle for these secondhand um, interpretations. It's very interesting because... Um... It's just something I'll share with you. An episode happened to me uh, um, this year. Uh, so after one of my lectures, the student came up to me and said, uh, "said Wow, this is great. Your class is like therapy." And I thought, I thought the next phrase that she would say would be, "It's so healing." And she said, "No." She said, uh, "Yeah, it's like therapy. You come with questions, but you leave with more questions." Uh, and so <laughs> at that moment in time, I, I thought I failed. But listening to you now, I think. Does that mean I've succeeded? Um, yes. yes, I think you succeeded. And I think sometimes the best uh, education might open the wound, as it were, that, uh, you know, there are things that we've kind of um, gone to sleep on in our lives or uh, avoid in our lives, and it's painful to open them up. But often the opening up of those difficult things is the way to live better, as opposed to being tranquilized into accepting things. So it sounds like philosophy for you, Paul, is actually really quite uncomfortable. Mm. And I suppose it's being comfortable with it being uncomfortable. Don't be spoon fed. Don't yes. put up with that. Yes, I do think that. And I think um, this is also true of teaching. Um, so I've, I've written a bit about this to the effect that if you think of two teachers, um, it could be in university or in, in school, and they know exactly what the curriculum requires them to do, and they prepare thoroughly and go to the class and so on. And they prepare their lesson plans as teachers in schools are generally expected to do. And uh, then the inspector comes around and sees everything's in order in the paperwork. The students actually, the, their work is marked on time and they're given appropriate feedback and the students do quite well. And one of those teachers goes home at the end of the day and she says, well, um, I completed that work, I've done that marking, um, they're all set to get these grades and so on. Um, I've turned up on time. I'm I'm doing my job pretty well. And then you can think of another teacher who's also marked the books and all the rest of it. And she goes home and she thinks, well, I don't know if I've timed that class today well. There was something wrong with the way I developed that point when I was explaining something. And really, I should have given more attention to the child who asked that question that seemed to be slightly off target, but nevertheless, was perhaps touching on something important. And on, and then later I was a bit quick, I was a bit dismissive of a student who came to see me after the class and just said I had to go because I was busy, but probably I should have spent more time with them. What I'm trying to get at is that the second teacher who's also marked all the books and all the, ra all the rest, she's ticked the boxes, but she goes home, not in a neurotic state, that's, that's important, <laughs> not neurotic, but uh, unsettled. You know, there's always mm -hmm. something more she could have done. So her conception of teaching is not on some scale where you satisfy the requirements of the job. It's kind of off the scale so that you've never done enough. And I repeat, I don't mean never done enough in some way that you're always giving yourself a bad time. You're getting neurotic about it. But on the contrary, it's an opening to the possibilities of education, of teaching and learning. And I think this can apply throughout the uh, years of our education. I think it can also apply in our own study of a subject. I, I worked with someone some years ago in further education who had recently acquired his PhD in philosophy. We were both teaching the same A-level groups. I was teaching English. 
he was teaching sociology and I asked him how he was getting on with them. And he said, well, it's all right for me now. I, I, you know, I've done my PhD. I know all sociology. <laughs> and I kind of thought, well, if you think that, I don't think you know what sociology is or mm. any other subject. There are things you can know fully. You can know how to learn use spreadsheets fully. But that's a technical skill over a limited domain. Whereas what we think of as subjects of study, broadly conceived, um, there's kind of no end to the possibilities of learning. That's one of their, their appeals. It's an economy that is not an economy of closure, of desire and satisfaction. It's an economy that's open and where desire intensifies the more it's pursued if it goes well. So can I ask okay. Paul a practical question? Um, and it's to do with chauvinisms, because possibly there is a chauvinism against STEM education and a chauvinism for STEM education. What would a progressive STEM education look like based on what you've said? Um, well, the things that STEM is concerned with are very important things in our lives, you know, engineering, um, medicine, science and so on. I think, think these are eminently things that should be pursued and studied and uh, improved as well. Uh, but as I intimated earlier on, they are not complete in themselves in the sense that um, while a robot teacher might uh, produce very good teaching in the technical aspects of the field, the human teacher is going to ask questions about what the point of this is or how this helps the human situation, why it's interesting as well. And um, I think that when the teacher is asking those questions, what the point of this is, what values are we working towards, why does this matter? Once you're into those questions, you started to do a, a bit of philosophy of science or philosophy of engineering. And uh, it's quite right that the professor of engineering does indeed do that. I don't think you have to have a special qualification to do this. I think it's part of the human condition. It is true that people who pursue philosophy and have those qualifications probably have taken these questions further and in more systematic ways, and one hopes have produced rich literature to support the general human concern with such matters. Where's your head right now? Well, I'm, I'm now thinking about, I'm sort of flipping it around and thinking about the educators. And uh, so um, how, do we, how do we encourage this sort of reflection on the part of the educators? And also, do we have enough educators who are predisposed to this kind of inquiry? Well, thank you for the question. I don't think it's a matter of just inserting an extra module into the modularized <laughs> course. Um, and I, it would depend on which educators we're talking about. And um, I accept that some subjects, um, I don't know, aeronautical engineering, I guess, you know, there's a huge amount of technical stuff and you perhaps have to become used to how to explain things appropriate to that subject. So subjects will have different demands. They'll raise different questions. The teacher of the infants class is in a different position from the teacher of physics at university level and so on. That, that much is obvious, but the general trend has been to take away the kind of literature, the kind of topics for discussion that were on teacher education courses at one time and to replace them with uh, um, texts or sources that are much more task focused, supposedly more practical so that the teacher knows how to deliver the curriculum or how to maximize the university students' chances of realizing, uh, getting good grades and realizing those objectives. And I, I think, you know, this fails to deal with the thing I talked about much earlier on, about the way that the teacher's own experience will bring them up against problems and questions about human nature, about the nature of knowledge, about how the teaching of a subject should be undertaken. And those questions are themselves philosophical. Mm. How do you help them to think about that? Well, one thing is to give them um, what Roland Barthes called writerly texts. A readerly text is something like the instructions on a fire extinguisher, which should be um, involve minimum, minimal interpretation. And so you read the instructions, you know exactly what to do, no possibility of variation. But there are books written about education and about life, of course, more generally, where that is not the approach. You know, it's not a straightforward story that you're reading. It's not a straightforward essay you're reading, but it's one that puts you in the position of having to think at every point where the writer is uh, themselves struggling with the their construction of meaning here, what they're trying to say about the world, about, about education or whatever it might be. So to, to give an example, uh, Rousseau's Emile, 
um, published in 1762, that used to be a very familiar text on the courses of people training to be teachers. In, in this country and in many other countries, it's disappeared now in favor of practical uh, sources about how to, to deliver the national curriculum or whatever it is. Now, Rousseau's text was sometimes used in a very bad way as though it was a recipe for how, how to bring up children. And it's a very brilliant, um, uh, you know, it's a very innovative text in that it, it's genre bending between an essay and a kind of story. And he's kind of jokey at some times, then profoundly serious at other times. Alan Bloom, the great American um, uh, literary critic, said of uh, um, Emile that this is the philosophy, the phenomenology of mind, that's Hegel's title, phenomenology of mind masquerading as Dr. Spock. <laughs> Dr. Spock's not the one on the Starship Enterprise, it's yeah, Mr. Spock. Dr. Spock is the psychologist who produced yeah. all the baby books that's influenced a generation in the United States and to some extent here. So the brilliance of that book means that you're easily wrong-footed by it. A lot of teacher educators sim simplified it. There's a boulderized version, in fact, and they, they destroyed some of this opening to thought, this challenge to thought that's there. And, um, you know, Rousseau's point is not to tell you ex exactly how to bring up or educate a child, it's to challenge the society we live live in to challenge it for its, you know, he's talking about 18th century France, to challenge it for the phoniness of its values and uh, standards and traditions, and to try to say what matters in life and how do we grow up properly attuned to the world? What makes a better society? So it's a kind of alleg allegory, um, which Rousseau almost deliberately sets up to rival Plato's The Republic. It's a vision of how the world might be different, seeing education as playing a crucial part in how we become what we are. So I think if if the if the text we're talking about that those who are learning to teach read incorporated books like that, or William Dereshevitz's Excellent Sheep, you know, that would be a, a very valuable step forward. And I could produce a longer list if you wanted it. <laughs> but I think that that would be a way of opening up what teacher educators are doing. The other thing I would say is that a lot of teacher education misfires because students don't have a sufficiently vivid sense of what it's like to be in the classroom. And they're anxious about um, you know, how to manage the uh, audiovisual aids or how to manage behavior. That's the big thing in, in schools. But what I would much rather see is that they had a short introductory course and then opportunities for continuing education throughout their career where that continuing education was not tied to um, objectives neatly fitting in with the prevailing policy and practice, but was a much more open exploratory exercise re related to texts of the kind I've been referring to, as well as to policy documents and other, other things that might they, they might treat as uh, contestable, as subjects for discussion, as subjects for their own exploration about what their own lives were about, what, what meaning they could find in, in what they were doing and how they could impart meaning to their students in a convincing way. I was going to ask you about trends that you're seeing, but I think you've pretty much covered it. Going back to your co-editorship of the Journal of the Philosophy of Education, what's your priority in that respect, in terms of seeing the thinking that's coming through? Hmm. Where are you at with that? Well, uh, um, the Journal of Philosophy of Education doesn't have an agenda. Um, you know, it sets out to uh, publish the best work we can in philosophy of education as broadly understood. So that's covering the, the range of things I've been talking about today. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, a journal is not just um, controlled and managed by one person. Um, it should be a, a, team, a matter of teamwork through the editorial board the editors themselves, and then extending through the reviewers who do so much work in evaluating papers and commenting on them and refining them. And I think it's desirable that there should be a degree of disagreement amongst those who are involved. My sense of democracy in the good life is the fact that we should want to live in societies with people we don't much want to live with. I don't know if you follow what I mean there. I yeah, once yeah, said this... Course, yeah. uh, um, 
Yeah. So so the point is that if you want to live with people you want to live with, then you're going to end up excluding a load of people and actually having the problems where things become a bit too cosy and insular. So the tensions that are really there in democratic societies, actually in societies more broadly, but in, in democratic societies especially, are ones we should uh, appreciate and want to be with, however, although of course they're very painful and difficult at times. So by the same token, I think if you're going to have a vibrant um, intellectual project, like a, 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 to run a journal, or to run a department for that matter, I think it's good for there to be a degree of, di of tension within the department of differences in view, rather than some sort of orthodoxy. And where would you like to see um, uh, to see the field go? Where would you like to see it develop? Well, I'd like it to um, have much more impact on policy and practice. Um, now, it, it, we know our journal has been read by. Uh, people in the um, in, in government and, and their advisors and so on. And we've sometimes been consulted um, over these matters. But on the whole, this happens less than it used to. Mm. And I think you have to understand this in terms of the way that policy is made. That if you take something like the Robbins report into higher education in, I think it was 1961, then that document is a very discursive, attractively written um, discussion of the prospects for higher education in the 19, early 1960s and the, the change that that report brought about. Similarly, the Plowden report into education, which is really about progressive primary education, child-centeredness, in 1967 is also uh, something like 200 page um, uh, agreeably written discursive document. By 1997, the Deering report into higher, higher education was a 1700 page report, most of which was appendices, mm. appendixes, I suppose I should say. And, and it includes one page on the aims of higher education, uh, which as with most other pages is a series of bullet points. Mm. Now this structuring of the report, the, the thinking in terms of bullet points, of course, sometimes it's reasonable, but it can actually be a way to close down thinking or to, to seem to be covering something by putting a phrase there without actually presenting an argument. Um, then you have to think uh, also of the, the effects of the media in relation to this. Um, a government minister now will come into a new post, not have much time to get ready for that post because they were working on defence or something else before. And then very quickly they have to be briefed they need to know phrases they can use, the phrases they'll repeat over and over again to make sure they're on message. And very often the context where they can present their ideas are not the speeches that were made perhaps 50, no, maybe longer than that, 100 years ago. They will be much more the sound bites of radio or um, oh. banners running across websites and so on. They'll, they'll have to produce their words in a way that can be consumed very readily by people who themselves are on the go all the time, readers who are on the go. So this context militates against serious reflection on these matters. I don't, I, I'm sure there are very serious, decent people working in the ministries, and I, I don't want to be, appear, appear to be rubbishing everything they do. But the, the structure of these matters has altered so, so much. It's, it's more difficult to take the time that the arguments we've entertained today um, require. So I would like that what I've just said to be accepted by Ooh. people in positions of power so that they deliberately invited this kind of element more forcefully, more strongly into um, uh, policy making. Conversely, I wish they would stop um, seeking evidence-based policy because what that's generated is a culture of research where money is available for research projects that show that a particular policy has a basis in evidence. So it's all done the wrong way around. And it's based on gathering information. They're not funding research to look into what might be the best way to do something or what different values might cover something. A measure of this performativity is actually there in what I've just said, uh, I inadvertently said the best way to do something. That the best way to do something or what works best, these are actually stock phrases that are banded about now, but they don't mean much, neither does efficiency or effectiveness, unless you know what you're trying to do. And what you're trying to do in education is contestable. 
So there's a danger if we put all the emphasis on efficient production of results, we just avoid the question of what we should be trying to do or what good understanding consists in or the different substantive questions at the more micro level that education is concerned with. Paul, I know you've said elsewhere that uh, the educational landscape is seriously depleted or maybe the deflected is the phrase that we uh, you've used today. Um, contrary to that, what inspires you? Where do you go for, for your inspiration to think more in the way that you're, you've demonstrated to us today? Okay, well, um, I, I think I've asked these questions throughout my own schooling and, and um, throughout my life afterwards in some way or other, um, certainly throughout my, my life as a teacher. And um, I found myself uh, actually rather focused on the question of autonomy that was, I was aware was quite prominent in, in education. And I thought there was something not quite right about it. And on the strength of that, um, as you know, Toby, I started to read um, Heidegger and Wittgenstein. And both those thinkers uh, support a line similar to what I've been trying to describe. Um, in the course of the last 40 years, I've also uh, become very interested or have been very interested in the work of Stanley Cavell, um, the American the Harvard philosopher who died in 2018 in his early 90s. Um, and Stanley Cavell is an interesting figure in that he's not someone you can pigeonhole in any particular school, neither has he generated a school. Um, he's someone who uh, has been perceived to be a, um, on the margins of analytical philosophy or a maverick in relation to analytical philosophy because he's taken issue with it in various ways. But as it were, from in a sympathetic way or from the inside, it's not as though he's advancing some um, vastly different thesis. And the subtlety of his thought, I think, takes me through many of the ideas that I wanted to pursue in relation to the ideas I've mentioned. He wouldn't use the phrase beyond the self in the way I've done. Um, he once said, you know, he was always puzzled by the phrase when people said, aren't you taking yourself too seriously? Well, I mean, when anyone says that, he was always puzzled by that <laughs> because he said, well, if the self isn't something to take seriously, I don't know what is. <laughs> and what he meant was not that we should therefore introspect and constantly self-examine in that kind of way. What he meant, I think, was much more close to what I've been trying to articulate that's to say that we find ourselves in circumstances where too often we're repeating words that someone else has passed down the line to us, to borrow phrasing from Heidegger's translators, or we're saying something that we know is kind of expected, but it's not really something we have any conviction behind. So <coughs> what he's concerned with is finding out what you can mean, whether you can mean what you say. And what you say, whether what you say means what you want it to mean, or whether it all goes wrong in the process. So this is a kind of experience that I think is very familiar to most people in adolescence. And I think in a way, people give up on it and then settle for some pre-formulated version mm. and become adults. And then it stops them from thinking. Mm. I think I'm in favor of a kind of a continuing adolescence. That's to say a continuing becoming adult rather than us having arrived at adulthood. So an education that continues through life, he describes philosophy as the educa as education for grown-ups at one point, deliberately using that child's word, grown-up, grown as opposed to a, adult or human being or something else. And so, you know, his first book was called Must We Mean What We Say? And perhaps I said that, I'm not sure. But that question is one that I think has multiple senses and relates to this trying to find things in the world that you can mean, where you can understand something or have a formulation of something in which you can say, yes, that's how it is, isn't it? That's how it is. And then that's not an isolated process. It's not something you do by yourself, because part of this whole thing is a recognition that we're fundamentally dependent upon language. You know, our language is not a means of communication so much as the very source of our thought, our coming into language as small children, is coming into the world. And language is not just language, it's always Polish or French or German or Japanese and so on. It's a particular language we come into 
in the community we're brought up in with its particular possibilities, its particular limitations and so on, its particular way of opening up the world. So our coming into language, I think, is something that should, again, be ongoing so that you're constantly trying to find words to say what you mean, as I'm trying to do now. And that should be, that should involve a degree of struggle. Not every moment, every day, but being brought up short sometimes by a phrase you've used or by what someone else says, by having to think again, by having a shift of aspect, as Wittgenstein says, as a response to what someone says. These are all deeply um, educative possibilities that are opening for us. And the language we use and what we can mean, what our words do mean, that should be, what our lives do mean, that should be a central thing for us. Yours is a very useful struggle, well, Paul, thank you. Paul, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your, um, your insights. Um, this was fantastic, very inspirational. And as I was listening to you, uh, uh, I was just, uh, the episodes from my own educational <laughs> practice were f flooding my memory. Um, and I'd have to think more about it. Thank you so much. Paul, thank you. And I feel disturbed by what you've said. So thank you. That's a good situation <laughs> to be in. Thank you very much indeed. So please, Toby. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's most enjoyable, most enjoyable to talk to you. Goodbye then. Thank you.